أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Tonight is without exaggeration and far from hyperbole the single most important night of our lives. Anyone who believes in God and surrenders to His will and decree and has faith in God's ability to determine our fate knows that tonight is a fateful one. The previous two nights of Qadr were either preparations for this night or according to some traditions, there is the possibility that the eve of the 19th of the holy month of Ramadan and the 21st of this month could potentially be the night of destiny. However, we have several indications that the true night of Qadr is tonight. We don't know for certain. We don't know for sure. And there is a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as one hadith states, Akhfa Laylatal al-Qadr bayna al-layali. There are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not reveal to us. The day of judgment is a knowledge that is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the holy messenger of God, the imams of the Ahlul Bayt, they do not have access to this particular piece of information. The day the imam of the time returns is also exclusive to God. According to some of our scholars, the Imam himself does not know when that day will happen. Perhaps the reason is that it is something that will be determined in the future. It hasn't been determined yet. God hasn't made a decision yet. And so even the Imam of the time doesn't know that. Some of our traditions state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concealed His loyal, righteous servants among the masses, among the people. Akhfa waliyahu baynan nas. And this could be a reference to the Imam of the time that we might come in contact with, we might encounter but we simply don't recognize him. The same way the brothers of Yusuf, the children of Yaqub, they encountered their brother. He was the king of Egypt, but they didn't recognize him. Traditions tell us that we will encounter our master, our imam, but fail to identify him. So these are some of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept hidden and there is a reason, there is a wisdom behind the concealment of this information. One of those is which is the night of Qadr. Now, even if the previous two nights, the 19th and the 21st, were Laylatul Qadr, tonight would be extra special. Why? Because we have traditions indicating that it is Laylatul Qadr, which makes it our last chance. And that is why tonight is incredibly special, my dear brothers and sisters. Let us try and focus for a few minutes so that then we could begin the rituals and the deeds and the supplications of this evening with a heightened sense of awareness. That we don't just read along as if the sound of the supplication is something that's happening in the background. It's not background noise. Let's make sure that we make the most of this night. Why? Because it is a fateful night. 
Sometimes people are told that there is a fire sale happening in a department store. People flock to that department store. They line up outside. There is chaos, there is pandemonium. Why? Because they know that many of those products being sold at that department store are now heavily discounted. They're 80% off, they're 90% off. And so in order to get their hands on that TV that they've been craving, people are willing to push each other away, sometimes get into fist fights. Why? Because they have the chance to get their hands on a product that is discounted. Tonight, we have the chance to shape our future, my brothers and sisters. And I especially want to single out the younger members of the audience. Heed my advice. Take it from someone who is least worthy of giving you advice. But after all, I am quoting to you the verses from the Holy Quran. The narrations of our masters, the Imams alayhim salam And so, listen to what I have to say. Try your best to apply these instructions so that you may make the best of this incredibly fateful night. So, here's a question. What are we supposed to do on the night of Qadr? on the night of destiny. What exactly are we supposed to ask for? A lot of people have asked me this question. What is the best dua? What is the best deed? Right? What is the best invocation that we can recite? Now, I've listed a few of those things which come to mind. The first is that you might ask for your wishes and your desires. Humans are nothing but a pile of needs. This is what we are. Think of how easy it is for someone to simply die, right? Think of the three rule. Have you heard about that before? We can only survive without air for three minutes maximum. We can only survive without food for how long? Without water for three days. Without food for 30 days. How easy is it for someone to simply drop dead? How vulnerable are we? How weak and fragile are we? And so because humans are nothing but a pile of needs, we have a lot of them. Is it okay if we ask tonight for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to satisfy some of those pressing needs? Sure. Someone's looking for a good wife. A young girl is looking for a good husband. You're looking for a good job. You're looking for a nice place to stay. These are our needs. Is it okay to ask for those? Absolutely. After all, you are knocking the door of the one who has khaza'in as-samawati wal-ard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it all. Allah is the ultimate sustainer and provider and giver. So why not ask Him? There's no question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make it happen. One of the passages that we read in Dua al-Jawshan, if you understand Arabic, then pay attention to what the Dua is saying. If you don't understand Arabic, make sure you read the translations provided to you and try and contemplate over them. One of those passages is this, Ya Qadhi al-Hajat, Ya Mu'ti al-Su'ulat. You are the one who can satisfy wishes and desires and provide us with what we need. You are the one who can give us what we want. After all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is described as such. Ya man la taziduhu kathratul ata' illa judan wa karama. Unlike creations of God, whose possessions are limited, whose belongings are finite, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has infinite generosity. He has access 
to the treasures of the heavens and the earth because he created them and he can certainly create more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he gives, unlike the rest of us, his possessions do not decrease. Ya man la taziduhu kathratul ata. The more he gives, the more he has to give. Illa judan wa karama. He gets more generous the more he gives because he has more of the same. Subhanallah. So, should we ask for our needs to be fulfilled and satisfied, whatever they may be? Absolutely. The second thing that we could ask for is to have our sins forgiven. This of course is more important than asking for our needs to be fulfilled. Because this has to do with our afterlife. This isn't just about satisfying a primal, carnal need in this world. This is about having our records expunged, having our sins forgiven, having our crimes deleted and removed from our records. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can and most certainly will do that. However, while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us once again in Dua al-Jawshan, Ya Kareem al-Saf, Ya Azim al Ya Hassan al-Tajawuz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He forgives, again unlike human beings, we may forgive but not forget. Someone who's hurt us, we may find it within ourselves to ultimately forgive them and we should, especially on this night. Just issue a blanket forgiveness to anyone who's ever hurt you. Don't you want to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Irhamu man fil ard, irhamukum man fil sama. Show mercy to those on earth so that the one in the heavens shows mercy to you. We should forgive everyone. Oh, but they really hurt me. So what? So what? I can still feel the hurt and the pain. So what? Forgive them. If you expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to also forgive you. Whatever that other person did to you was most certainly nowhere near the level of hurt, nowhere near the level of the insult. As when I committed a sin and an act of transgression against the creator of the universe. Surely it was less. So forgive them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only forgives, but His mercy is so boundless that when He forgives, He Himself forgets. He's the one who never forgets. And yet He acts as though you never committed the sin to begin with. Ya Kareem as -saf. It's like your entire history has been completely erased when I genuinely and truly repent on this night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acts as though I've done nothing wrong in my entire life. That is possible. We can achieve that. We can accomplish that. However, there are conditions for that. Let me read you a few ahadith and illustrate using a few important points. The first thing that's required when you're about to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent for your sins is that you confess your sins. Meaning you have to acknowledge them. You have to be remorseful. These are two distinct points. The reason the desert of Arafat for those of you who have been to Hajj or perhaps during Umrah you took a tour of the desert of Arafat which is one of the stations of the pilgrimage rites and rituals of Hajj. People go there. The place is called Arafat. The hadith says the reason it's called Arafat is because people who go there are expected to perform what we call an Arabic i'tiraf, to confess their sins, to say, Ilahi, ana alladhi asayit, ana alladhi, 
مستحييت انا الذي سهوت i am the one who committed that sin i acknowledge that i confess that i take responsibility for what i did i know i made a mistake actually thinking of your sins one after another as far as you can remember so number one, to acknowledge and to confess them when you do that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. We say in the dua, Ya man yaqbalu udrat ta'ibin. O one who accepts the excuse of the ones repenting. Imagine you commit a sin and then you address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Oh Allah, I know I did that. But it was my bad friend who led me into this pitfall. I was too young, I was naive, I was stupid. Now those are terrible excuses. Those are unacceptable in any court of law. But as terrible as those excuses are, Allah is so merciful, He will accept them anyway. You'll say, I had a bad circle of friends. I grew up in the wrong environment. I didn't live among a community of believers. And so I just followed the flock like a sheep. I did what everybody else was doing, even though deep down I knew this was wrong, even though my parents were warning me. But I did it. It's a terrible excuse. Allah will st still accept it. Ya man yaqbalu udral ta'ibin. So, be remorseful. I made a mistake. That was wrong of me. Number one. Number two, be grateful for what you have. We said that it's okay to ask for your wishes to be fulfilled. But do you also count your blessings? Do we also think about all the great, beautiful things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us? The infinite number of gifts that we find in our bodies alone. I've talked about this at great length in my lectures. Throughout the years, I don't want to get into that because I don't want to veer off from our main topic. But just think of the things that you have. Right? People talk about the gift of eyesight. Imagine you didn't have the ability to see. Imagine if you were blind. Think of the people who are unable to see things. Think of people who were born blind. They don't know what the world looks like even. They don't know what the different colors represent. They don't know what their parents look like. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you this. He deprived others of this gift and He will reward them for that. He will compensate them. He will deal with them in a manner that is appropriate and suitable with His justice and His mercy. But also, it's a reminder for the rest of us. Imagine if you were like them. Which is why we have a hadith, if you see someone who is ill, someone who is disabled, someone who is incapacitated, you should quietly murmur this dua beneath your lips. Don't say it out loud. Don't hurt their feelings. Just quietly remind yourself, Alhamdulillah afani mimma walaw fa'al. Praise be to the Lord who did not afflict me with this illness. And had he wished to afflict me, he would certainly have done so. Have you counted not just the blessings of the eyes, but the blessings of the eyelashes, the blessings of the eyebrows, the blessings of the eyelids? I've mentioned this example before. A person who was the victim of an acid attack says in an interview, he speaks at length about the suffering that he had to endure because of the sulfuric acid that was poured into his face, instantaneously melting, not just his clothes, but also his outer skin. Speaks about what he had to endure in hospitals, how they told his family that he wasn't gonna survive, and all the rest of that. And then he says, you know the one thing that I miss the most? is my eyelids. Because without my eyelids, my eyes are always open. I can't even sleep. I'm always awake. 
If I do fall asleep, it's for a fleeting few moments. Who thinks about the blessings of the eyelid? I know somebody who because of a stroke, he couldn't close his eyelids or sometimes couldn't keep them open. So he always had to hold his eyelids with his finger to keep them open like that. Who thinks about that? And think of every single part of your body that was a blessing from Allah, which was given to you without you deserving any of it. You didn't even, I didn't even deserve to be created, let alone be given all of these luxuries that I could never show gratitude for. More important than physical bounties and blessings, Think of the fact that tonight so many people are so lost. They don't know anything about the night of destiny. They don't know about this fire sale. They don't know about the boundless mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's been distributed on the night of destiny. They don't know anything about Amir Mu'mineen. They don't know anything about Imam Al Hussein. The fact that you do, the fact that you came into this gathering, you're not sitting here because it's too cold outside. You didn't come out because you wanted to have fun. You came here in remembrance of the Ahlul Bayt salam, the Imam of your time, and to pray to Allah to forgive your sins and to give you more of His infinite blessings. Isn't that the greatest blessing of all? That you are a mu'min, you are a Shia, you're a Muslim. Counter blessings. Think of those things so that Allah would then forgive your sins. The third condition of having our sins forgiven is what? Brothers and sisters, there is an entire chapter in the blessed book of Al-Kafi as well as other collections of hadith called Babul Israri al Dham the chapter on insisting on acts of sin and transgression. The first thing we have to do if we are to receive God's mercy tonight is to stop insisting on acts of sin. Listen to this hadith. It's terrifying. It's mortifying. This is serious brothers and sisters. The hadith says it is in the blessing, blessed book of Al-Kafi on Abi Basir. He quotes Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. He says, لا والله لا يقبل شيئا من طاعته على الإصرار على شيئا من معاصي. Imam al-Sadiq swears in God's glorified name. He says that by God, Allah will not accept any of the deeds that we perform so long that we keep insisting on his transgressions. We keep insisting on committing sins that we know to be wrong and immoral and forbidden. Someone who comes to the program or who recites the supplications and seeks forgiveness, but insists on listening to music. As soon as the holy month of Ramadan finishes, subhanAllah, someone was joking saying that on the day of Eid, some of us will feel a shiver. Don't worry, that's the shaitan restarting his engines once again. He's reestablishing that connection. On the day of Eid, sins begin to pour. On the day of Eid and in the name of Eid, the hijab gets loosened, the makeup gets put on, music gets played, on the day of Eid, subhanallah, shaitan was shackled throughout the holy month of Ramadan. Now he's free to wreak havoc in our lives. Someone who listens to music and doesn't, it doesn't bother them that this is haram. That's insisting on the act of sin. If you expect to be forgiven tonight, you have to make a resolution. Tell yourself, no more music. This is serious. This is important. A woman who doesn't wear hijab, that's insisting on an act of sin. A woman who puts on makeup according to every marja, it's haram. Every marja. Oh, but it's just a foundation. 
You can't really see it. If you couldn't see it, why put it on to begin with? Every marja says it's haram. Don't reveal your beauty, your ornaments. That's insisting on an act of sin. The Quran tells us, لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة إلا أحصاها. Every tiny little act of transgression. Don't say this is a small sin. Don't say everybody is doing it. Don't say it's okay. My mom does it. My dad does it. It's all written down. When you're buried, you'll be buried all alone. It won't be with your parents. Someone was telling me the other day, a person who's interested in converting to Islam was saying, I am hesitant to convert because I wonder what's going to happen to my parents, what's going to happen to my family. I said, well, that's the wrong question to ask. The real question is, is Islam the true religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If it is, you should convert, then wonder how to help your parents. You know when you're on an airplane, they give you safety instructions. And one of the things they always say is if the oxygen masks drop, you should attend to yourself first, then to others. Even if it's other children. Start with yourself. Ya amanu, la man You have to find your own guidance, your own salvation. Start there. Charity begins where? At home. Start with yourself. Then worry about other people. Sometimes people ask me, especially here in the West, because they have friends and they have acquaintances, oh, what's going to happen to non-Muslims? I say, don't worry about that for now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is much more merciful than you and I will ever be. Allah will know how to deal with every single individual. Muslim, non-Muslim. That's his job. Your job is to be a good Muslim who obeys the instructions of his Lord. So, because my mom does it, because my dad does it, because my brothers, my siblings, my friends, you'll be buried all alone. You won't have anybody answer for you. The hadith says, لا صغيرة مع الإصرار Don't belittle the sin. Because if you're insisting on committing that sin, it's not a little sin anymore. With insistence, there is no such thing as a small sin. وَلَا كَبِيرَةَ مَعَ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ And also have hope that there is no great sin so long as the door of repentance is open for you. You can always repent. And when you repent, you're on the safe side if your repentance is genuine. Imam al-Sadiq tells a story. He says, one day, the Holy Messenger of Allah, the Prophet of Mercy, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He and his companions were traversing the deserts. They came across a patch of land that was incredibly barren. Ardun qar'a. It had no vegetation, nothing. It was just sand. So the Prophet told his companions, go and gather some firewood. The companions looked at the Holy Prophet, they said, Ya Rasulullah, innaha ardun qar'a. There's nothing on this land, no trees, no plants, and therefore no wood. The Prophet said to them, it's okay. You should all just go out, spread out, and pick whatever small piece of wood or branch that you can find. It is a barren land, but surely you can find some things. So they went out, each of them picked a handful or so. They came back and threw it all together. It became a pile. Rasulullah then looked at them and said, This is how sins accumulate. You don't necessarily see it. You don't see it as being big. But little by little by little, it becomes a pile. And then on the night of destiny, you look back, you examine your life, you perform a self-retrospection, and you see, oh my God. Look at all the things I've done throughout the year. 
all the things I've done throughout my life. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam recited the verse in the Quran. He said, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ And it's all counted. It's all accounted for. And it's going to be brought to you on the day of judgment. نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ One of the worst things people will experience, may Allah grant us safe refuge from that. May Allah, by the grace of the Imam of our time, in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen, in honor of Rasulullah, protect us from that. But one of the worst things that happens on the day of judgment is having all of our actions brought together and displayed for everyone to see. All the things that I tried to hide, all the things that I did in secret, all the thoughts that I harbored deep inside the recesses of my soul, it'll all be brought out. Not a film of what I did, but the actual sin itself will be presented for everyone to see. Tashhadu arjuluhum. Their feet will testify against them. Their hands will testify against them. Their eyes, their tongue. We're standing before the judge, the jury, and the executioner who has knowledge of everything, and yet the witnesses to our crimes will be our own organs. My own body, my own soul will testify against me. In fact, it's going to be so shameful that traditions tell us some of the people being held to account and being questioned, just as the trial is about to unfold and their actions are being presented, na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, they will start running towards the pit of the fire of hell. And they'll say, please stop, stop. I know I'm bound to go to hell. Let me just throw myself in there. Fires of hell. I'll throw myself in there. Just don't expose my actions before everybody. My parents, my brothers, my sisters, my family, my neighbors, the whole entire world. I'll throw myself in the fires of hell. وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٌ مُّبِينٌ The Holy Prophet then said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْمُحَقَّرَاتِ Beware of the so-called trivial sins, the ones that are belittled. They asked Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, they said to him, what are the muhaqqarat? What are these belittled and trivialized sins? The Imam said, when a person commits a sin, and then they say, either to themselves or to other people, I'm so lucky because I only have this one sin. Doesn't that ever happen? They're like, I only do this one thing, otherwise I'm a good Muslim. Imam al-Sadiq says, that's a sin that you're belittling. Some commentators on this hadith have said, the reason the Imam says that is because the whole point of repentance is to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is to appreciate the grandeur and majesty of God. But when a person commits a sin and thinks that that sin is little or trivial, that is the opposite of glorifying God. It is in a way dismissing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grandeur. In one hadith the Imam says, if a five-year-old was present at the time you were committing the sin in secret. You know those, those sins that happen in the privacy of our own rooms? Or when people aren't looking? The Imam says if a five-year-old child was looking at you, you wouldn't do it. You don't even take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a five-year-old child. He's watching, he's seeing all of this. But he's not important even to the level of a five-year-old kid. You're happy to commit that sin in his presence? And then you say, this is my only sin? Oh, I don't wear hijab. I put makeup. I don't pray. But it's, I mean, otherwise I'm a good man. I'm a good woman. The Imam says, that is the muhaqqarat. That's a sin that you trivialize. And that's much worse than a big sin that's committed 
and then you're remorseful, you're repentant, you ask Allah for forgiveness. But the one that I keep committing, it means I don't care about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let him watch. So what? It's a small sin. Na'udhu billah. So, we should ask for repentance, but be mindful of these points. Finally, do we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Should we? Perhaps this is more important than all of the previous points and things that we should be asking God for on such a night. Should we ask Him to be given a pardon from the fires of hell? Absolutely. The main dua that we recite on this night, which is the dua where we place the Holy Quran above our heads, prior to doing so, we ask Allah, Allahumma inni as'aluka bi kitabika al-munzal, wa ma fih, wa fih ismuka al-a'zam, then we say, an taj'alani min utaqa'ika min al-nar. Oh Allah, exonerate me. Give me a get out of jail free card. Give me a pardon from the fire of hell. That is an incredibly important dua. However, one of the conditions of that, as we said, is that we don't insist on committing small or seemingly small sins. Listen to this hadith. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says that in the holy month of Ramadan, on every night Allah will grant immunity from the fires of hell to at least 600,000 people. Am I one of them? I don't know. And that is part of what makes it so troubling and disturbing. I don't know if I've been granted. I've asked for it. But was I sincere enough? Was I good enough? We don't know. And that state of suspension is critically important. If I knew, I'd probably give up. I'd probably just relax as far as my religiosity is concerned. I don't know. The Imam therefore says that Allah grants immunity to 600,000 people. Then he says, this immunity is available for anyone except these three individuals. Listen carefully. And these are perhaps examples that the Imam is giving. He says, the one who breaks his fast on something that's haram. If a person does that, they are not, they're not subject to receiving that redemption from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Breaking your fast and doing so with something that's haram, that's number one. Number two, the Imam says, Aw mushahin. Mushahana in the Arabic language means hatred. If a person harbors hatred towards other believers, this is why I said it's important that we forgive and forget. This is why it's important that tonight we say to Allah, Oh Allah, I have forgiven anyone who has ever hurt me, so forgive me. Mushahan. The one who harbors enmity towards fellow believers. If they are believers, forgive them. If they love Ali ibn Abi Talib, forgive them. If they love the Imam of the time, forgive them. The one who harbors hate, Allah says, you will not be granted that enmity. Finally, the Imam says, Aw sahibu shaheen. The one who plays with shaheen. So they ask the Imam, what is sahibu shaheen? What does that mean? The Imam said, the one who plays chess. Oh, but it's beneficial. It's good for you. It increases your brain's capacity. It's great if you want to get into fields that have to do with math and science and what. I don't care. I don't care. The Imam says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not grant redemption to the one who plays chess. Again, these might be examples that the Imam is giving us. That if you're mired with sin, if you're stained with transgression, how do you expect to receive redemption from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Hit the brakes, make a strong and determined resolution. Decide for yourself tonight that you will stop every act of sin. Then open your heart and expect the best from Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, in my humble opinion, this is important. The single most important thing you could ask for tonight is what? We talked about our wishes to be granted, our needs to be fulfilled, forgiveness for our sins. We talked about the conditions of forgiveness or some of them. We talked about being granted redemption from the fires of hell. We talked about all these things that you could ask for and you should. But what is the most important thing? In many of our du'as, we have a statement that I want to draw your attention to. We speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when we address Him, we say, وَفْعَلْ بِي مَا أَنْتَ أَهْلُهُ وَلَا تَفْعَلْ بِي مَا أَنَا أَهْلُهُ Oh Allah, do with me what is suitable for you. Treat me in a manner that suits you. Don't treat me in a manner that suits me. In other words, I recognize that I'm sinful. And I'm filled with the stains of my evil actions from head all the way down to my toe. And if you are going to treat me with justice, I know I have to book my one-way trip to the fires of hell. If you're going to treat me on the basis of your justice, however, I know Ilahi, Sayyidi, Mawlai, that you have mercy that supersedes your justice. Sabaqat rahmatuhu ghadabah. And because that mercy of yours is so great and infinite and all encompassing and supersedes your anger and wrath and justice, treat me with that. If you fulfill what you have to do, you do what you're supposed to. You perform the rituals. You make those resolutions. You make the decision. I said to a sister just last night that you might find this to be difficult. You might think, how could I start, start wearing hijab when I haven't worn it since I was a kid? How do I stop putting makeup all of a sudden? What will people say? How do I stop listening to music? How do I stop this sinful pleasure that I'm addicted to? It brings an addiction. How do I do all these things? I said, remember this beautiful statement and reassurance from Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Imam said, Ala min Allah al If your resolve, if your resolution, if your commitment is strong enough, Allah will give you a strong enough backing and support from His side. In other words, the, there's a direct correlation between how much Allah will support you and help you and how strong your commitment is. If it's a wishy-washy kind of commitment, oh, I'll try to stop that, then you won't get a strong backing and support from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says that God's support will be proportionate to your commitment. So you do what you have to do, then you say, Oh Allah, treat me in a manner that befits you, not me. You know how sometimes, especially in third world countries, Arab countries, Muslim countries, um, when you're dealing with somebody, like a taxi driver or a tradie or something, they do a job for you, then you'll say, Well, how much do I owe you now? The response is, Whatever befits your generosity. When they say whatever befits your generosity, you know you're in trouble. Because if you give a little, then it means you're not generous. If you give a lot, then it's more than what they deserve. It's a 10 minute taxi ride. You probably owe them no more than $5, $10. But when they say your generosity, they're putting you on the spot. Tonight, Allah has instructed us to put him on the spot. If I could use this terminology. He has said, when you speak to me, tell me, treat me as in a manner that befits your majesty, your glory, your generosity, your mercy. Don't look at me. Give me something that is proportionate to 
the limitless extent of your generosity. Now, here's a pro tip I want you to think about. We have narrations that if you want Allah to grant you your wishes and to give you what you want, first pray for others. SubhanAllah. The hadith says that if you pray for your believing brothers and sisters ghayb, without you even telling them. Don't even go up to them and say, I pray for you. No, no. How most people commit ghiba, which is yet another sin that we have to make a commitment to stop committing tonight. Slander, backbiting, talking about other people. The way most people commit ghiba, in fact, the definition of ghiba is when you slander people behind their back. The Imam says that if you reverse that and you pray for someone behind their back, Allah will send an angel. The angel will address you and say that we will give you 99 times whatever you ask for your believing brother or sister. In other words, not only will we grant your wish for your brother and sister, we will multiply it for you. We'll amplify it for you. Allahu Akbar. If that is the reward of praying for brothers and sisters, especially those going through pain and destruction and bloodshed, if that's the reward you get for praying for them, imagine the reward you would get for praying for Imam al zaman You want your prayers to be accepted? Pray for the Imam of the time. When you pray for him, incredible things will happen. Number one, you've prayed for the one who is closest and dearest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like doing, going to someone and you need a favor done by them and you show kindness to someone who's loved by that person. Their son, their husband, their wife, their neighbor, their friend. You show kindness to them. How do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you in exchange for that? The other incredible thing that will happen is when you pray for the Imam of the time, the Imam prays for you. In Islam, we're required to greet each other by saying, Assalamu Alaikum. And it's required, this is recommended, and it's required for that person to then reciprocate the gesture. When you say, Salamu Alaikum to someone, that person has to say, Wa Alaika Salam. Now, if we say, Assalamu Alaika Ya Hujjatallahi Fi Ardi, if we pray for the Imam of the time, how do you think the Imam will reciprocate that? All we need, brothers and sisters, is a single prayer from the Imam tonight. The dua of the Imam is always answered. The dua of the Imam is such that traditions tell us when the Imam prays to Allah, relief will then come and God will send him and he will reappear. When the Imam prays, he will reappear. So imagine if the Imam prays for you, which is why Shaykh Abbas al-Qummi in his Mafatih al-Jinan says that one of the best acts on the night of destiny is Dua al-Faraj. Allahumma ajjil li waliyyika al-Faraj. Allahumma kulli waliyyika al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala aba. Fi hadhi al-Sa'ati wa fi kulli sa'a. Waliyyah wa haafidha wa qa'idha wa nasa. ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا. He says in fact that when you get up, read this dua. When you sit back down, read this dua. When you're about to walk to the car, read this dua. In between the various supplications, read this dua. Read it as much as you can, he says. One of the best duas tonight. Dua al-Faraj. Pray for the Imam. And dua al-Faraj is not Dua for the reappearance of the Imam. It's dua for the Imam himself. It's dua for the Imam to find relief. Not so that he comes and fills the earth with justice and equity and cleanses and uproots injustice and oppression. No, no, no. This is for the Imam himself. How do you think he will react? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who teaches us this in the Quran. Because people will tell you, well, pray to God directly. What's the point? Why pray for the Imams? Why ask the Imam to pray for you? Don't listen to this garbage, which appears all nice and neat in its facade, in its outer appearance. Allah teaches us in the Quran, when the brothers of Yusuf went to their brother, what did they say? They said, Ya ayyuhal azizu massana wa ahlana dhur wa jihna bi bida'atin muzjaat fa'awfilana al-kayl wa tasaddaq alayna. O oh, Aziz, O oh, King, we have been afflicted with terrible tragedies. We're poor. And we have brought to you a scarce offering. What we've brought to you is nothing. Our supplications, our prayers, our deeds, they're nothing. But we want you to reciprocate and to compensate and to give us much more than we gave you. وَتَصَدَّقْ عَلَيْنَا Give us your charity. Make dua for us. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَصَدِّقِينَ Allah loves those who give charity. يَا حُجَّةَ بْنَ الْحَسَنِ مَسَّنَا وَأَهْلَنَ الظُّرِّ جِئْنَا بِبَضَاعَةٍ مُزْجَاتِ يَا إِمَامَ الزَّمَانِ يَا صَاحِبَ الْعَاسِ أَوْفِ لَنَا الْكَيْلِ تَصَدَّقْ عَلَيْنَا Pray for us, يَا حُجَّةَ بْنَ الْحَسَنِ The Quran once again teaches us when you feel remorseful from your sins, what do you do? Again, you go directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's teaching us, it's right there in the Quran. They went to their father when they repented. Ya Aban astaghfir lana. Oh father, ask Allah for forgiveness. My face is darkened. I've committed way too many transgressions. Even one is one too many. How could I face Allah? How could I ask Him? I'm too ashamed. I want you to ask Him. You're a much better than, man than I could ever be. Which is why the Imam himself says, أَكْثِرُ الدُّعَاءَ بِتَعْجِيلِ الْفَرَجِ فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ فَرَجُكُمْ The Imam says, pray for the relief, meaning the return of the Imam, the reappearance, as often as you can. أَكْثِرُ In excess. As much as possible. فَإِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ فَرَجُكُمْ Because in doing so, Allah will bring you relief. Not in the return of the Imam, you will find relief. No, no, no. Praying for the Imam brings you relief. Your sins will be expunged. Your problems will be solved. We have to recognize, my brothers and sisters, that all of our problems are bound to the fact that we have no access to our Imams. Imam Hussein's tragedy, who is the one who's going to avenge him and restore justice for him other than the Imam? Fatima to Zahra being killed in broad daylight. Imam is Zaman, pray for him. The Imam will restore justice. The fact that so many people are deviating, the Imam is the cure and the Imam is the solution to all of that. Imagine if there was a family this family had a loving father. The father was taken to prison. Listen to this example. It'll illustrate my point. They take the father to prison. And because of the absence of this father, the family falls apart. The kids, they don't know where to go. They fall into the trap of poverty. They lose their home. They lose their possessions, their belongings. One day, a high-ranking official, the president, the prime minister, the king. Because it's a day of celebration, it's the national day or it's some Eid, happens to come to the town where this family lived. Everybody gathers around. The king is jubilant, he's happy. And he wants to celebrate this occasion. So he says, today, anyone who asks me for anything, I will grant their wish. I'll give you whatever you want. So one of the girls of this imprisoned father. A member of this family happens to be there. Imagine if they told her, go up to the king and say, I want a lot of money. Or go tell him that you want a home for your family. Or go tell him that you need assistance in one thing or another. What's she gonna say? She'll say, what do I do with money? Money comes and goes. A roof over our head is something that's temporary and transient. 
I want my father back. If you truly can bring him back, all I want from you today is for my father to come back. Imam al Ridha says, Al Imam Al Abul Shafiq, Al Walid al Shafiq, Wal Akhu al Shafiq. The Imam is our father. We want our father back. In other words, if there was one dua that we have, which is guaranteed tonight, that it'll be fulfilled. And we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers prayers on this night. But here's a, what I want to suggest to all of you. Let's make that dua for the return of our Imam. Let's give that dua, let's use that card that we have for the sake of our Imam. Let's show ourselves to the Imam and say, Ya Hujjat ibn al Hassan, I know I have needs, I know I have issues, I have problems, but you are our father. And if you came back, if only you came back. And so I will make that dua, I will dedicate it for your sake. Ya Hujjat ibn al Hassan, Ya Rabbi, Ya Ilahi, Ya Sayyidi, if you're going to answer just one prayer from this sinful slave, make it for the return of our master. The turn of the return of the Avenger. Subhanallah. A person came to the Holy Prophet. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I have dedicated all of my deeds for you. Any thawab that I get, I am offering it to you. All I do when I'm awake is pray for you. Do you know what Rasulullah said to him? He said to him, Idan kufita ma'una dunya wal akhirah. Then Allah will look after all of your affairs in both this world and the next. And so tonight we say, Ya Hujjat ibn al Hassan, I'm offering everything that I have, every morsel, as little, as petty, as worthless as it is, I'm bringing it to you. I'm offering it to you. Imam Rida tells a beautiful story. He says, One year there was a drought and famine. Such that that year was called Amul Ju'ah, the year of famine. People didn't even have any food. There was this woman who had a child. She became so poor that she lost her home. She didn't have a place to stay. So she took her son and she went out into the desert and she lived in a tent. One day, this woman had two bites of food, a small loaf of bread. She broke it in half. She gave one half to her son. And just as she was about to eat the second loaf, the second half of the bread, which was just one bite, she was about to eat it, a poor man came by the tent. He said to her, Ya Amat Allah, al Jua, al Jua, O servant of Allah, I'm hungry. So this woman thought to herself, it's the year of famine. All I have is this one bite. But you know what? He's an old man, he's hungry. So she offered that bite to this man. I want you to think about this, brothers and sisters. One of the things you should do tonight is give sadaqah. Take a substantial amount and give it to someone in your own family. Someone overseas, someone who's struggling, someone who's poor. You all have them. You know who I'm talking about. And a substantial amount is relative. For someone who's rich, it means ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. For someone who's not so rich, average, you're a young person, Take two, three hundred dollars, send it to them. Listen to this hadith. Imam Ridha says that this woman gave that one bite which she had to this poor hungry man. After she gave it to the man, her son got up, left the tent, and he was playing outside. After a few moments, she heard some noises. Her son screamed. She went outside, she noticed that a wolf had caught her son, and the wolf was pulling him into a hole to devour the young boy. The woman started screaming. She was in anguish. She was terrified. The Imam says that Jibra'il came down to the earth in the form of a man. He went to the wolf. He pushed the wolf away. He took that young boy. He carried it. He carried him with, with both his arms. He walked up to this woman's tent. When he arrived, he said to her, Ya Amat Allah, Araditi luqmatan biluqma. Are you satisfied? One bite for another bite. You gave that bite to that poor man. And Allah saved your son from being eaten 
and taken as a bite by the wolf. Araditi luqmatan biluqma. So we say, Ya Hujjat ibn al Hassan, tonight if we have any bite, if we have anything, if Allah wishes to grant me anything tonight, I wish to offer it to you. I will pray for your return. Because I know that you will look after me. I know for a fact, I swear in your name, Ya Hujjat ibn al Hassan, that you know what's best for me. Your dua is answered. You will look after me. You will pray for me. I'll tell you one final story and end this. The Holy Prophet he had a servant. He served him for some time. Then one day the Prophet said to this man, he said, you've served us for a few months or years or what have you. Is there anything you'd like me to give you? Some form of compensation. He looked at the Prophet. He said, yes, I want five sheep. Rasulullah said, take five sheep from my money and give it to this man. They gave him the sheep, he walked away. The Imam said, I, the Prophet said that I wish this person had as much insight and intellect as the elderly woman of Bani Israel. Because this same exact thing happened to the people of Bani Israel. One day Musa alayhi salam was traveling through the desert. He, he came across an encampment. There was an elderly woman living there. This woman, she took care of Musa and his companions. She cooked a meal for them. She gave them comfort. Then Musa said, is there something you want me to give you in exchange for what you did? How can I compensate you? She said, yes, Ya Musa. I want you to pray that Allah raises me with you on the day of judgment. The Prophet said, I wish this man could think the same way as this woman. I'm telling him, is there something you want me to give you? So we say, Ilahi, Sayyidi, Mawlai, if there is something you wish to give us, give it to the Imam of the time. Grant him relief. Allow him to return. Allow his tender heart which has been broken and bloodied. 14 centuries of oppression and injustice and bloodshed against his forefathers, against his ancestors, against his followers, against his lovers. Grant him some relief and reprieve. Now, we've been told to visit Imam al Hussein tonight. It's one of the greatest acts. Imam al Jawad salam, says that visiting Imam al Hussein on the eve of the 23rd of the holy month of Ramadan allows that person to shake hands with 124,000 prophets. And so let's visit Aba Abdullah al Hussein by visiting the land of Karbala. One of the greatest tragedies in Karbala and greatest acts of injustice was depriving Aba Abdullah al Hussein of water. It was such a great tragedy in fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he spoke to Adam and gave him the asma to repent with and to invoke so that Allah forgives his sins, Allah told him that you should pray in the names of Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein. As soon as Adam heard the name of Hussein, he said to him, Ilahi, whose name is that? As soon as I heard it, my heart broke. Something in me changed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then told him the story of Aba Abdullah. In other words, one can say that the first person to recite the Masaib of Aba Abdullah was God himself. He told Adam who Hussein was. What will happen to him? But the one thing that God focused on and mentioned to Adam was Aba Abdullah being deprived of water. The musibah of atash and thirst. Allahu Akbar. As I said, tonight we're supposed to hold on to the Imam of our time. The same way the companions of Imam al Hussein held on to him. Imam al Hadi alayhi salam in his Ziyarat al Nahiyah mentions. One particular companion, a man by the name of Bishr al-Hamrami, he says that this man lost his, 
He, he came to Karbala all alone. When he was in Karbala, he received news that his son had been captured by the tyrants of the day. So Imam al Hussein heard about that. He went to Bishr al Hadrami. He said to him, Ya Bishr, anta hillun min bay'ati. Anta fi hillin min bay'ati. I relieve you of your vow and pledge towards me. Here is some money. Here is a fast horse. Take these and go and save your son. Save your son. Do you know what he said to the Imam? He said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, akalatni sibar in anafaraktuk. May the beasts of the desert eat me alive. Akalatni sibar hayyan in anafaraktuk. Aasma'u anka min al rukab. Wa atrukuka ala qillat al ashab. Ya Aba Abdullah.